Richard Clarida, the Vice Chairman of the Federal Reserve, thank you for being here. You bet. So let's just start out where we are in terms of U.S. growth, yeah. which has slowed down a yeah. little bit this uh -huh. year. What's the outlook? I think the outlook, sir, is we had a really strong year last year, 3% growth. Uh, and I think growth may slow a bit this year, but uh, the unemployment rate's at a 50-year low. Inflation is, you know, at our goal or slightly below. So the U.S. economy is in a good place. Here at the IMF World Bank meetings, though, the theme is the synchronized global slowdown yeah. that's happening around the world. And, and one big question is how much that affects us and spills over into the U.S. Yeah. How do you think about that? And, you know, Sarah, there is an effect uh, through several channels. One, when the global economy slows, our exports tend to slow down, and we and we see that. Also, as you know, the U.S. is part of a global financial market, and so if there's uncertainty abroad, that tends to spill over to our markets as well. So it is a factor, you bet. What about, I mean, it feels like we've had a few false alarms with recessions. You know, we had that steep drop in stocks last December, yeah. and everyone was talking about recession. We get one bad data or mixed messages on yeah. the economy. Why do you think we're so sensitive to that? You know, I'm not sure. You know, this this expansion is now in July. This will be uh, a 10 year plus expansion, the longest in U.S. history. And so perhaps people are conditioned to thinking that as these things go on, there's more of that risk. But, you know, Sarah, we, we don't see it. We don't see an elevated uh, recession risk. There are a lot of different indicators. You know, they move up and down. But as I said, the economy's in a good place. What happens if the U.S. and China are able to reach a deal on yeah. trade? What would the impact be on the economy? I think it would be a positive. I think it would be a positive because there's some uncertainty about whether or not that deal uh, gets done. It's obviously constructive, as we saw with U.S., Mexico, uh, Canada. You know, I think some good news is probably anticipated, but it would be a positive for the economy. For Do you sure. think the, the Trump tax cuts are still fueling this economic growth? Well, certainly, as I mentioned, you know, 2018 was the strongest year for growth in, in a decade. The tax cuts are on the books now. Uh, they had certainly had a positive effect on the economy last year. And I think it's too soon to tell how big an effect they will have. But it's been a positive. And on trade, I yeah. mean, you mentioned that it's been a source of uncertainty. How yeah. much do you think that the global slowdown is being caused by the trade tensions that have been elevated? I haven't really seen an estimate of that. I guess my sense is, is probably not a lot. I think there are other factors. I think that's more things that people worry about that could, could be a problem, but I don't think so far it's been an issue. Some people are wondering if we're starting to see green shoots globally, the Chinese mm. manufacturing number, the yeah. fact they've stimulated their economy so much. Is it too early to say that? <laughs> I don't think I'll use that term, but what I would say when you look at the data, Sarah, um, is that the macro data globally has been surprising on the downside now for about a year. So if you rewind the clock to a year ago when you were here, there was a lot of optimism. I think now perhaps the, the expectations are more in line with the, with the data and there's some prospect for an upturn in, in global growth uh, later in the year. You're sounding very positive to me yeah. I mean, on global growth, on U.S. growth, and yet the Fed has made a big reversal. You, you, you're patient, you're on pause. Yeah. I mean, it seems like a big U-turn, and the market has certainly responded. Well, I wouldn't characterize it that way. What we've said is that we can afford to be patient because we're really operating very close to our goals of maximum employment and price stability. You know, there's been a lot of rate normalization that has been done under both Chair Yellen and, and Chair Powell, and we think it's appropriate now to be patient and step back and see how the data um, evolves. And so, as I said, the economy is in a good place, and I think monetary policy is in a good place. Are you surprised to see how strong of a market reaction there was? I mean, the market's up 16 percent so yeah. far this year, one of the best starts to a year yeah. ever. Well, what I would say about that is, you know, markets, as you know, you're, you're a pro, markets go up and down, and we don't want to be handcuffed, you know, to the daily moves. But we, of course, look broadly at, at equities and credit spreads and and volatility in a lot of uh, markets. But I think the markets are really reflecting the fact that the underlying, you know, momentum in the economy is good. Um, and as I've said, you know, we think the economy is in a good place. So I guess markets uh, also see that. But there's no question that the, the move to patience was celebrated by this market. Of course. And it does also raise the question about whether the December hike was a mistake. I don't think it was a mistake. I voted for it at the time. And if I could rewind it, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change that view. I think the December hike was justified given where the economy was and also justified given that it was important for us to get the policy rate in the range of what we've called neutral. And as Chair Powell has indicated, I've said in my speeches, the policy rate now is in the range of neutral. And when you're neutral, you can afford to be patient. You know, a year ago, we weren't. We were below neutral.
there's also talk that, you know, the Fed is right now being bullied by the markets. The markets threw a tantrum after December, and the Fed totally changed well. its tune on the balance sheet and on the interest rate trajectory. How do you respond well, to that? Well, I've heard that, and thank you for reminding me. I'd say a couple of points. On the balance sheet, you know, the balance sheet is something that, that we've been discussing both publicly and in the committee, really, several meetings last year and this year. And we were always going to make a decision on the balance sheet, and we made that decision this year after a lot of deliberation, and I think we've communicated it well. Obviously, QE was untried going in, and there's not a playbook for coming out, so there's probably some market uncertainty about that, and we've resolved that, I think, uh, appropriately. Uh, but as I said, I think we're in a good place, and I think in terms of responding to markets, you know, a lot of folks weren't saying that in December. Uh, when folks were calling for us to pause. So I think we just do the, Sarah, we just put the monetary policy in place that has the best chance of achieving our goals on a sustained basis, and, and that's really what, what we're all about. How high right now is the bar for a move, either to hike or to cut? Well, I think one of the virtues of having the ability to be patient is that you just let the data uh, come in. Uh, we don't see a need now for a move in either uh, uh, direction. Uh, you know, we'll be getting more data. Uh, we had some issues in terms of the shutdown, in terms of getting data late, and so it's going to take time to assess all that. We'll get Q1 GDP uh, pretty soon, so we're looking Checking at all of that. around 2% now, yeah. according to the Atlanta Fed. Yeah, Atlanta definitely, it definitely been, been perking up from some of the earlier tracking uh, estimates. So I don't think I'd characterize it in terms of a bar, other than to, just to repeat myself a bit and say we're we're in a good place. What about inflation? Because yeah. the data there has shown a deceleration. Yeah. Why do you think that is? That's a great point, because as you know, we have a dual mandate, and the fact is, is that inflation for most of the past seven years has been somewhat below our 2% uh, objective. Indeed, last year with 3% growth and a 50-year low in the unemployment rate, core inflation was 1.9%. Uh, I think there are a lot of factors. I think globalization is a factor. In, in some ways, Sarah, I think the fact that we and other central banks have been successful at keeping inflation low and stable, you know, makes it perhaps more difficult to get inflation up than it may have been in, in the past. Uh, so we're looking at all of those factors, and we do think it's important. Chair, Chair Powell has said this recently. It is important for us to demonstrate that inflation can get back to 2 percent and stay there on a sustained basis. The president, President Trump, has pointed yeah. to the lower inflation yeah. numbers and said the Federal Reserve should be cutting interest rates. What do you think when you hear that? Well, you know, um, we, there are a lot of opinions about monetary policy. I'm sure they're held in good faith. Uh, monetary policy is more of an art than a science, and so we respect that folks will have differing views. Uh, but again, we have a committee of 17 now at full strength 19, and we make a decision based upon the evidence and the data and our analysis of what we need to do to achieve our mandate. The market is also starting to price in more of a cut, 50 percent odds by December yeah. and more than that for next year. Does the market have that right? Well, let me just say about that. I think market pricing is a little bit tricky to interpret sometimes, uh, and I wouldn't characterize a probability right now on what we're going uh, to do, uh, uh, but uh, I'll just leave it at that. I mean, a rate cut happens when you see the outlook deteriorating or a potential recession. It doesn't sound like you're there. I certainly am not there for a potential recession. Now, if you look back at Fed history, I'm not looking to the future. If you look back at Fed history, there have been times when the Fed in the 90s took out some insurance cuts. We saw that in 95. We saw that in 1998. So uh, rate cuts are not always associated with recession. But as I said, we certainly don't see a, we certainly don't see a, a recession right now. Is it harder to tune out the political noise and the pressure right now because the president continues to well, go after the Fed I, chairman I, and Fed policy? I, what I can tell you, Sarah, is, you know, I and my, my colleagues on the committee, are, we're just doing our job. It's a complicated world. Folks are going to have opinions. We respect that. We're just, we're just doing what we need to be doing. You went to dinner at the White House, correct? With, with I did Fed attend chair that Powell. dinner. How, what was that like? And I will just comment that uh, that uh, I enjoyed the the opportunity, uh, and um, and I'll leave it at that. We issued a statement after that dinner, which I think speaks for itself. So there's there's now talk of two prospective Fed nominees. They would yeah. be not typical in terms of their yeah. background, and there's some concern about Fed independence because yeah. of their close ties to, to President Trump. Well, let me just say very clearly, a decision on who to nominate is up to the president, on confirmation is up to the, to the Senate, uh, and so I'm not going to weigh uh, in on that. Uh, I don't really know either of them very well, 
Um, and right now, we're, we have a committee of five governors and, and of course, the Reserve Bank presidents, and uh, we'll just focus on, on, on that right now. Do political views enter into the discussion around the table on monetary policy? I've been there six months. I've not seen it. Not, I've not seen it around the table. I've not seen it, you know, in the hallways. You know, we, the, the nice thing, sir, about the way we're organized is that our mandate is in statute. There is a, there is a statute in the law that says we are charged with maximum employment price stability. We have a professional staff that does arm's length economic analysis, and so it's pretty easy for us to focus on what we need to do there, and that's what we're doing. So if Herman Cain and Stephen Moore get to Senate hearings, is there anything you'll be listening for in particular? I think there... I don't have any comment on that. We can talk about that, you know, after they've had their hearings if you want. But... All right, fine. Let's talk about the bond market. Okay. Let's say we have a sustained yield curve inversion here. How yeah. should we read that? Well, okay. So the yield curve, of course, is the difference between the 10-year yield and the short yield. Um, and yield curves can, can steepen or flatten for a variety of reasons. I do think that outright persistent prolonged inversions are rare. Certainly, I would, I would pay attention if we had a sustained prolonged inversion of the yield curve. We're not there yet. We had a brief inversion that lasted for a couple days last week. I think the other thing, Sarah, that makes interpreting the yield curve a little bit more tricky now is the fact that because of global developments, um, uh, the term premium uh, it is the extra yield investors require to hold a 10-year bond, has been moving around a lot, and in particular, by most estimates, in negative territory now. That means bond yields are being depressed because of the desire to hold safe assets and not just about our policy path. And so at the Fed, we would have to try to educate ourselves if we did get a sustained inversion, if that's due to some information about the economy or our policy, or if it's reflecting other factors in, in, the, in the global bond market. So it's I mean, a little that, bit trickier now. That is a question, right, about yeah. whether, whether even the 10-year yield right now reflects the state of the U.S. economy or is oh. more impacted by what's happening oh. in Europe with the ECB. And as you know, when I, when I did your show uh, uh, before, we used to talk about that a lot. And, and certainly the U.S. is the center of the global bond market and what happens in Europe and in Asia. Uh, has a big impact on 10-year bond yields over and above whatever we're doing here. Uh, with the 10-year yield at, at these levels, does it suggest something to you about the U.S. outlook? It suggests to me that the economy's in a good place and that the market sees an economy with stable inflation and, and, and growth that, that's solid uh, and doesn't have any particular view right now about any change uh, from that. Again, with the proviso uh, that bond yields can go up and down for reasons outside of what we're doing or what's happening in the U.S. What's the biggest risk, as you see it right now, to the U.S. economy? Well, I think, as I said, um, you know, among the known unknowns, I think uh, we have a pretty good handle on that, as do the markets. I think the risks are the things that you don't necessarily, you know, have an ability to factor in. And, and you know, we've gone through several potential uh, risks. Um, I think what I would say is a risk that, that is one that I think is, is not a particular uh, concern now is that the global financial system and the global banking system in particular is much better capitalized and has much more liquidity than a decade ago. So although we can talk about the risk, we also need to reflect some improvements in the financial system He's as well. You it into a positive. Yeah, I do my best. <laughs> what about Brexit? So they're going to kick this can down the road until Halloween. Yeah, yeah. How much of an impact could that have on the U.S. economy if things go disorderly? Yeah, well, again, you know, we have yet another extension uh, of, of, of the Brexit. And it's, Brexit, of course, as you know, you've reported on it, is very complex. There are a lot of possible scenarios there. You know, we've looked at those. Um, what we can say is that we and central banks and other countries that would be affected have been really focused now for, for, for some time on making sure that financial institutions are as prepared as they can be for you know, for, for un unfortunate outcomes to Brexit. Uh, you know, again, U.S. institutions don't have a lot of direct exposure uh, relative to their capital uh, right now, and we're monitoring it very closely, uh, as are central banks in other countries. Thank you very much. Thank Richard you, Richard Clarida, the vice chairman of the Federal Reserve, ended with the Brexit question. For